quick. Hey, thanks everybody for uh, for being here. All right, so let's get uh, started really quick about me. Um, as I was introduced, my name is Jesse Sanders. I'm from uh, Denver, Colorado in the United States. I'm a founder of a company called Brebug. We help people solve large enterprise problems using Angular. Um, I am a GDE in web technologies. This is my first international trip. Now, I've been to Mexico. I've been to Mexico a few times, probably about 10 times to Mexico, but this was quite the adventure. And uh, I really got to say thank you to uh, Nitter and everybody with uh, Angular Up. It's been an absolutely fantastic trip. I never thought I'd ride a camel. I'm not sure I will do it again, but it was fun. And I'm also an NGRX enthusiast. If you haven't seen, I talk a lot on NGRX. I mostly travel the United States talking about it. I've got a new uh, tattoo idea here. I don't know. I mean, I think it's... It, no, I should probably do it on yeah, that arm. Um, I got it, some weightlifting I need to do, but, y you know, whatnot. All right, so anyway, once upon a time. Well, back in the old days, like, coding used to be really hard. We'd have to walk through the snow uphill both ways, two feet, you know, of snow is horrible. But no, in reality here, being an, um, an application developer for the last 20 years, it used to be really, really difficult to develop enterprise applications. And when Angular came out, I started working with it back in 2013, and it really changed my life and how I approach things. But then we, you know, we went on to Angular 2, and, and that was awesome. And the other thing that happened is this new library came out, you know, NGRX. So it was announced, what, about a year, three months ago, something like that at, at uh, Angular, uh, actually NGConf and super excited about it because it started to help us solve some of the bigger issues. How do we develop large-scale enterprise applications and manage state? So who is, who's using NGRX right now? Oh, great, quite a few of you. So before NGRX, I remember this, this concept, we'd have a, uh, it started out fairly simple. It only had like 30 lines in it. We usually call it something like session service, right? And so I'd usually put some user information in there and who's logged in and what their roles are and, before we know it, all of a sudden I end up with uh, 600 lines of code. It's very messy, and it's got a, a large header at the top that says, do not touch this. This will break production. Who's got a, a, a file like that, right? All right, I know there's probably more of you out there. So NGRX is really there to help us solve those problems. But then what we start to see as NGRX has really gained a lot of popularity is we start to see some new problems crop up, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're really going to talk about how do we model our state in Redux so that we can avoid some of these other issues and understand what those issues are and what the, co you know, what the price is that you're paying for doing that. And then give you a solution on how you can approach this so that you don't have to make those mistakes. Sound good? All right. All right, so let's talk about the store. You know, the NGRX store allows me to have a single source of truth. I can go ahead and put data into it and then be able to uh, pull the data back out and, and render it into my application. Makes it really nice. But people get really confused about what am I supposed to put in the store? What, you know, it's like, oh, should I put this in here or this not or how much data? So we'll talk about that here for a second. We think about data that's shared. And now shared data might be stuff that's shared between multiple components on a single page, or it might be data that's shared across multiple pages, and um, we don't want to have to keep reloading it from the, from the back end. Something that's fairly static, like let's say roles or something like that. Um, another really good candidate for putting data into the stores, we have derived data. So a lot of times we'll go ahead and pull data in from our API, but it doesn't really exactly suit our needs. We need to, to uh, derive it. We need to. Um, we might be taking a couple of fields and adding them together, or multiplying, or you know, some sort of a derivative of that data, and we need to modify it. So that's another really good candidate for it. Anytime we want to be able to restore the data is a really good candidate. So if you think about who's using the uh, the store dev tools right now and understands time travel, right? Who's not going to raise their hand no matter what I say? Anybody? Anybody out there? Okay, a couple. Good. Good. All right. I think you, I fooled you, though. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so anytime we want to be able to restore data. So the one, th one concept I want you to understand here is that every single thing that happens in your, in your application is a new state. And so for you to be able to recreate that state, you need to think about what needs to go into the store. So anything that, that's responsible for that state, you know, whether things are uh, UI elements, data, um, application state, that sort of stuff, those are all things that you're going to want to put into the store. Another really big advantage of the store is we can do cache data. 
So it's, if we need to cache data, we can go ahead and put it in the store. We don't have to keep re reloading it. And then we'll also take, uh, we'll talk about selectors a little bit later and how those cache and, and the, some of the benefits that you get there. So we talk about, there's really three types of data for our stores. One is application data. And I already kind of covered this a little bit in terms of roles, user information, stuff like that. Um, we also have UI data. So this would be, you know, the sidebar is expanded. We've hidden the toolbar. We've hidden the footer or whatever. You know, we might have a dialogue, a, a modal showing, something like that. So we want to go ahead and store that so we can recreate the, the application state just as, as the user was seeing it. And the last one is entity state. So this is anything that we're downloading, you know, from our APIs. We're getting that data down. And we're going to go ahead and place that into our store. So if we were to look at the overall store, this, this is kind of a, a representative of what you might see. You'd see some app state data, some domain data. We'd have some UI data, maybe have a couple different UI states. It's a fairly good representation of multiple stores within the larger uh, store. So let's talk about store anti-patterns, because this is really where the problems start. One is we start to see people take entity data and they place it in relative um, to what the UI is. Let me give you an example. So I might have a sidebar that displays products. So I'll go ahead and place these products in a store that holds UI data about whether the sidebar is expanded. So I'll have um, a store that's called UI that then I have an, um, a property on it called sidebar and then I'll go ahead and attach my products, customers, orders, whatever data to that. That's a really bad pattern because really the sidebar doesn't own it. The sidebar is just using that data. And so what we then see is then another developer comes along and they'll take that same data and they'll place it into a top level store. And now we have two copies of the same data. We want to avoid that. Um, another really bad anti-pattern I see people doing is they keep too much data. So they start to use the client side store as like their client side database. And they're going from instead of storing just a couple of K of data, you know, they're, they're starting to store megabytes and moving towards gigabytes. Okay, and then wondering why the browser is really no longer responding in a way that's, that's ideal for the client. Um, and so users complain. So really the, the idea here is only store enough data to be able to re-render the page as it is now. You're wanting to look to be able to dump that data back out and flush it as soon as possible. Then you get away from any sort of thing like stale data um, or, or too much data. The other one, and this is the one that we're going to talk about today a lot, is nesting. So JSON's beautiful, right? It's really easy to be able to create relationships, and I can go ahead and attach products to an order. I can go and attach a customer to an order. I can then go ahead and, and add line items and attach products to each line item and whatnot. And it makes it really nice for me to be able to then take that data and then using my components be able to render each one out and I can just enumerate over each piece, passing it down the next level, enumerate over those, pass that data in, it's great. But this is a really bad pattern when it comes to um, NGRX. You do not want to do this. So <clears throat> this, is, this is probably the number one problem that we see with people is the nesting of data. And this is a really good example here. So I'll have blog posts. We've all seen a blog post. And so I've got an array here. It's got an ID. It's got an author. It's got comments. And, it's got authors there again. So you notice that the author is, is uh, an object directly attached to it. And then with my comments, it's got an author attached to it. And, and on the, the, the last line there, I've got user one, and I've also got user one attached up there. So what is really the problem with this? One, it, it starts to create complex data structures. We don't really need to have our data out, laid out like this. It becomes very complex. Um, we have duplicates. So our reducer logic then starts to become very complex. Instead of having a single line reducer that's updating our state, now we have a 50 line or a 100 line or a 200 line reducer. This is a very common scenario. And so, and then the other problem we have is we have unnecessary renders, okay? So let's kind of go over this here. The, uh, the duplicates, we have duplicated data all over, the, all over the system. And what happens is I first start attaching users first to the post and then to the comments, and then you start attaching them to another area, and you start attaching them to another area. And now before we know it, when, they, when the user goes in to change their name in one spot, you know, on their profile, we can't get it updated across all the other different entities. Now our data is out of sync, okay? Um, so then 
as I said, you know, the reducers get really complicated. And the other thing that most people don't realize then is that since um, our data is immutable, when we go ahead and update that one property that's buried five layers deep, it causes all the components to re-render that, that use that, that top level store. Okay, so in a, in a large enterprise application, this can be very expensive and, and really degrade your performance. So what's the solution? The solution is to treat your client-side store as a client-side database. What we want to do is we want to have each type of data get its own table, its own store. Go ahead and promote them from, instead of being nested in, within each other, go ahead and promote them up to a top level. Go ahead and grant them a store for each one. So in our case here from our prior example, instead of having uh, comments be part of posts, we're separating those out. Comments has its own store, users has its own store. We're no longer duplicating our data. Our reducers are simple. It's very simple to go ahead and, and write tests for this. We take a lot of the complexity out. So where does this really come from? Well, this is not a, an Angular thing or an NGRX thing. This is actually coming from the Redux uh, JS org spec. And when they talk about nor normalizing client-side data, this is the first thing they talk about is like, okay, stop nesting. Let's go ahead and start promoting things to top level. So we've done the normalization, but then we have to start to have some problems here too, is now I don't have relationships anymore. I'm not able to quickly and easily be able to go and find the customer that's for this order. And so now what we want to start to do is look at moving away from arrays and preferring dictionaries over arrays. So it's not really a big idea here to say, okay, look, I need to find a single customer for the one order that I'm doing, but if I have a thousand orders and I have to go find, you know, do a, a find or a filter for a thousand different customers, this is a very expensive operation on the client side and the performance is not going to go well. So by doing dictionaries, we can go ahead and eliminate that. And when I want a product that has an ID of 12, I can go ahead and just, using square brackets, give it the ID. And instantly, it gives me the exact uh, uh, entity that I'm looking for. So what they recommend here is um, instead of being array-based data, we're going to store our, our um, entities as, a, as an object. And within that object, we're going to have two main properties. One is a, an array of IDs. That's going to be the natural order of our data as it came in, and then the, uh, the other one is going to be the dictionary, and that's our entities. So what does this actually look like in example? So this is a really simple here. I've got my posts. It now has an entities property directly in it. My, my key is my ID, and my value is my, my object. And then I've got my IDs property, and that's telling me what my natural order is so that when we go to recreate it and put it back into an array, I know what, what order it's supposed to go back into as. So then let's talk about relationships. So this is great. We've got the, our data. We're starting to put it into our store. And I've got my posts. I've got entities. And now you notice with my author, I'm no longer attaching an object to it. I'm actually attaching a key. And that way I can use that, that ID to then go to the user store, get the entities, and ask for user one. And I can instantly get that user. So now I can start to create those relationships that I was representing before with JSON, but now I can use this with selectors, passing an ID over, and, and I can get the data that I'm looking for very, very quickly. So this is a really nice idea, right? We got entities, we got IDs, but this seems like a lot of work. So if I had to do this for one entity, that wouldn't really be that big of a deal. I could go ahead and home roll this out, and, and this is how I convert it, and this is how I kind of do things. But what if I had to do it for 50? It starts to become a bit tough, right? A lot, of, a lot of coding to do. So I'd like to introduce you to something called NGRX Entity. Entity is, is our friend. This is what helps us create these relationships, and we'll go ahead and enforce this for us. It provides a lot of, um, uh, really, a lot of hard work, all wrapped up in a tiny little package and very, very easy to use. So let's take a look at it here a little bit. Like I said, it handles all the heavy lifting. So instead of having to worry about the, the IDs and, and getting the entities from uh, array-based data to um, um, a dictionary-based data, it's going to do all that work for me. I don't have to do anything. It also provides a bunch of selectors. So if you think about this, great, I've got it in a dictionary. I get it kind of whittled down to the, the data that I want, filtered down. Maybe I'm deriving it into a slightly different form. But then I need to get it out of the dictionary and back it into an array so I can enumerate over it using an ng4 directive, right? <clears throat> so the adapter that comes with the NGRX entity goes ahead and provides selectors for us to make this very, very simple, and we'll take a look at those in just a minute. 
So the adapter, it allows us um, to define properties. We can add additional properties um, to our entity. And, and probably the best way to describe this to you, we talked about app state. An app state could also include things like, are we loading products right now? Do we have an error while loading products? So one of the other things that we started to see um, in just general and consulting is that people would have this app data that they would be updating the properties on that while they are also updating the properties on their, their entity store, right? Um, we're loading products and they'd go ahead and set that, that property plus they'd go set it, you know, when the products came back, they would have to then say loading's done, there's no errors and now go ahead and set our entity. So NGRX uh, entity allows us to, instead of having to, to maintain this in two separate stores, we can actually move that application data closer and be right there at our entity and we don't have to have it in two spots. Um, it also provides, I think it's about seven um, static methods for adding, updating, and removing our data from the dictionary. And as I said earlier, it also gives us um, selectors to be able to get our data out of the dictionary and back over to our, um, our array-based data. So let's take a look at what, what the, this kind of entails. So as I described to you earlier, we have entity state. And it has two properties, IDs and entities. So when we create an entity state, we're going to pass in our model. We're going to pass in our type for this. And it's going to actually infer whether it's strings or numbers based on, on our ID. And then it's going to go ahead and create our entities property. And, and that, uh, that syntax there is basically saying that my ID is going to be of this type. And then it's going to return the type that we passed in. So that's going to be, ID is either going to be a string or a number and it's going to return the type of whatever our model is that we passed in. So let's actually see this in action. What, what do we actually do here? So this, this code would go into your reducer, um, except for the, the interface itself. We go ahead and de, uh, define our interface, export interface user. We have an ID, we have a name. And then this is where we're going to go ahead and use our entity state. We're going to create a new user state that extends entity state, passing our model. And I want to add these additional user state properties. The three most common that I see people needing is what's currently selected. What's my you know, order selected? What's the product? What's the customer? Wh which one is selected that I need to, to work with? And the other two that are very common is, is it loading? And do I have some sort of error? You could do error, I see it as string, or sometimes I'll see people do it as an object. I prefer to put it as a string so I can just give the user a nice simple message. Hey, there was an error while loading product. But again, your mileage may vary. All right. so. The next thing we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and create the adapter. Again, the adapter is the one that does all the hef heavy lifting. It has the methods for maintaining our dictionary, and it also has the, the selectors uh, for us. So in our case here, we're going to use our entity adapter, um, or it's, it's going to user adapter is going to be of type entity adapter, and we're going to use the function off of the NGRX entity library called create entity adapter, again, passing the type. So from there, it's going to go ahead and infer this is the model that we're going to use. It's going to determine um, uh, what the type is on the ID. Now, there's a couple additional properties here that I did not document for you in this presentation. But you can also change what is the ID. So in a lot of cases, you know, we don't have the, uh, the unique identifier on our object being just ID. It'll be user ID or it'll be product ID. And we need to be able to designate what, what's the name of that property. So we can actually pass that in. Um, so just after here, where it's user and we've got our open parens, we could go ahead and, and, and point it to um, what that uh, ID is uh, using a big arrow function. And the other thing that it, it offers us is, let's say we want to have our customers always sorted by last name. We can go ahead and use a sort compare so that it'll automatically insert and update that list and, and always have them sorted by the last name. So pretty simple there. All right, so from there, this should look fairly simple. We, when we're working with our reducer, we're always going to need to have, um, have an initial state. What are we starting our reducer out with? And so here, we're going to use the adapter to call get initial state. And the thing that I have to do here is I have to give it default values then for these new properties that we defined. So in my case, I want selected ID to start out at null. I want to set loading to false. And I want to set my error string to be nothing. That's going to be my initial state. So if you're writing a reducer today and you weren't using NGRX Entity, this is what it basically looked like, right? I've got my function. 
Uh, my state is going to default to my initial state, and my action is going to be user actions. It's going to return my user state. Um, I'm going to switch on my action type, and in this case here, I'm, I'm handling my load by ID success. And here, I'm, I'm returning a new array, I'm spreading my existing state, and then I'm appending my action payload, right? This should look fairly familiar. So what does it look like when we go ahead and change this over to the NGRX entity? It's actually almost identical. The only real difference here is instead of returning a new array, we're going to return a new object. And then I'm going to take my user adapter, and I'm going to call the function um, add all. I'm going to give it the payload that's coming in and what my prior state was. From there, it allows me to go ahead and set any new uh, properties like loading. I could go ahead and set errors to false or you know, to an empty string. Whatever other details that I need to set, I can go ahead and do that. I, I don't know if you notice this, but when I'm doing it with an array-based data, I have no way then to attach those additional properties to this. So this makes it really nice for me to be able to, to set my loading on and off and set errors on and off and whatnot. So the other one here, so let's take a look at uh, the adapter usage when we do have an error. I can go ahead and call my user adapter remove all, so I want to go ahead and just clear out my state. Now it doesn't actually delete all my state, it actually only deletes two of the properties. It takes the IDs array and it clears it out, and then it takes the entities and, and uh, sets that to a new empty object. And then you can see here I'm going to go ahead and set my uh, set loading to false, and I'm going to set the error to error while loading users. So it makes it really nice for me to be able to manage these um, application states while updating my uh, uh, entity store there as well. All right, so selectors. If the, uh, if the store is like a database, then selectors are like queries. These are super powerful. Who's using selectors right now? Quite a few of you, great. So the, the really two main benefits of selectors. One is they're composable. I love this because this means I don't have to write one big behemoth selector that's going to do everything all in one shot for me. I can go ahead and create an intermediate steps and be able to chain those to, uh, together. So by being composable, it makes it a lot easier to test my selectors and it makes it a lot easier to work with those. Um, and the other part that happens here, with each one of those selectors, they're all memoized. So unless the backend store has changed, then it's going to go ahead and return the same values as it returned last time. Okay, so this makes it super, super fast. If we have a really long calculation for some derived data, we don't have to keep repeating those processes each, each time um, at each selector. It's going to go ahead and return those, those cache values, and so we're going to get a really nice performance benefit there. All right, so in this case here, we talked about selectors that the adapter actually supplies. Um, in our case here, it's got four um, selectors that are available to us from the get-go. So using destructuring, I can go ahead and call my user adapter to get selectors, passing it the select user state. So select user state, so the other, the other one here is the create uh, feature selector. This is how I get my, my data back out of the store. So in this case here, I want the user store. It makes it really easy to do that. And then I'm going to pass in, that into my get selectors, and I'm going to use destructuring to map the select IDs to be the select user IDs. If I just want the entities property, now I have a new selector called select user entities. If I want all users in an array in the order that they were uh, naturally ordered, it's going to use the IDs and enumerate over that and plug those into a new array, and then I just use select all users. And if I want to get a total count of my users, I just say, I, I just use the uh, select user total selector, and I would have those. All right. So how do I get those, those, those additional properties that we created? In this case here, I need to define some big arrow functions that, that basically say, once I get the user state, this is how I get to that, uh, that property. So here, I've, I've defined a few constants, one for getting the selected ID, one for getting the error, and one for getting loading. So these are pretty standard. Um, typically, they're actually going to go in the, the bottom of your reducer file. And then in your index TS, that's where we go ahead and create our selectors. And in this case here, I've got two examples. If I want to go ahead and select the error, I'm going to create, um, use the create selector function. I'm going to pass it the select user state, and then I think I'm going to take the output of that and pass it to get error. So that's getting my, my user state from the store, and then passing it to my get error selector. And, and that's, that's pulling that data out and, and giving my error and giving me my loading. So pretty simple. All right, great. So 
how do we use this within our component? Here what I've got is I've got uh, my component. It's got a user's observable, a loading observable, and an error observable. Um, I like to use dollar sign on the uh, post pin there to, to make them uh, clear that, that uh, they're observables. In our case here in our constructor, I'm setting uh, our user's observable to be the store pipe of the select, and I'm saying select all users. So in our case here, I want to go ahead and get an array of users wrapped in observable, and I also want to get my loading and my uh, select error as well. So now I have all three of those wrapped up into an observable. In my HTML, I can go ahead and say ng if loading, um, and I'm going to run that through the async pipe. If that maps out to true, then we're going to have either you know some message chain users are loading, or more often I'm going to have some sort of animated GIF that's going to um, indicate to the user that we're still loading. When that turns to false and we emit a new value, that's going to go ahead and go away. Um, we can go ahead and enumerate over our uh, users, again, using the async pipe and just uh, create an unordered list there. And then lastly, if we have any sort of errors, I can um, pipe that out or I could actually take the, the error itself. I could change the error loading users and, and change that to be um, error dollar sign uh, with the async pipe and that would be a string uh, that we were returning earlier. So um, either way on that. So great. That's a, that's a fairly simple example, but the thing that, that, um, that we want to be able to do is relational data. So I want to give you an example here of how would we go ahead and tie this back to our relational data. So here, I'm, I'm passing on an input, a user ID that's coming into my child component. And I then have a private member variable for our selected user. Now what we're doing here is we're going to go ahead, instead of selecting all users, we're going to select our user entities. Now a lot of times we'll actually do this at a, a level higher and then pass the entities down to the, the child component and with the ID and then they can, they can match themselves up and find um, the appropriate uh, entity record. But our case here, I wanted to keep this all in one spot so that you'd be able to see how we would do this. So this is a fairly simplified example, but we're going to go ahead and select our user entities. We're going to subscribe uh, to the output of that. And we're going to set our selected user equal to be the user's, uh, oh, actually, it should not be dollar sign there. It should be just this.users using the user ID. So again, I don't have to do any filtering. I don't have to do any finds. It's super, super fast. I can immediately go in and, and allocate, grab that record, and now be able to use that user. I don't have to do anything special. So <clears throat> all of this here came actually from the NGRX website. Um, in combination, uh, well, actually, there's the, the normalizing state shape. This is the Redux JS org spec. Um, highly recommend if you haven't gone out there and you're using Redux, uh, read some of those articles. There's really some great information on how uh, you might best approach um, developing a Redux application. It's not specific to NGRX, but it'll give you a really good model to look at and how you might approach things. Um, and then the code, a lot of the code here, just in general and format and whatnot, is, is out on the NGRX uh, platform. Um, if you haven't uh, taken an opportunity to look at that code and kind of dig into it to understand it a little bit better, it's a great opportunity to see, one, how well it's written. It's very, very simple, very palatable, very easy to understand. Um, and uh, really some great examples in there. Um, if you want to find out a little bit more about this, you can reach out to me. You can follow me um, here on my Twitter handle. You can also email me. This is my email address. You can email me at any time. And there's also a whole bunch of content that we have on our Brebug channel out on YouTube. So a lot of content on NGRX as well as a lot of other subjects. So highly recommend you check that out. And that's pretty much everything I've got for you today. The other thing I do have for you, and I'll be out in the hall right after this, is I have a bunch of uh, uh, Brebug t-shirts I'd like to give away. Um, they're support local software. And the idea here, um, I've got about one minute left. The idea here behind supporting local software is having everybody um, like you sitting in your seat uh, begin to participate more in your local meetups, taking a chance and getting out there and speaking, presenting on topics, sharing with the community what you know. You know, I started doing this about three years ago um, in Denver, Colorado, and now I've been the, the organizer of Rocky Mountain Angular now for three years. And so it, uh, it's all about just making a difference in our community. And so if you'd like to talk about uh, NGRX a little bit more, I'll be out in the hallway. I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, otherwise, I think we've got about 45 seconds. Does anybody have a question? No, we're good? All right, great. Thanks, everybody.